Hi, this video is about nucleic acids and proteins, and it's almost impossible to talk about one without the other. So we talk about them together. We are going to talk about several different types of nucleic acid, but we're going to start by talking about DNA and RNA and the connection they have to proteins. There's actually a video that I want you to watch. I have posted a separate link, and it's a really cool image that I'll discuss in a minute, but it's from a video that really has nothing to do with the lecture I'm, I'm telling you today, except that it, I love the image it paints of the relationship between DNA, RNA, and protein. So DNA is really the recipe for how to make your proteins. It tells your cell the order in which to assemble the amino acids to make a protein. So a protein is a chain of amino acids, and we'll talk about that more in a minute. DNA is the master recipe for how to make every protein in your body. Every time you need to make a protein, that recipe on the DNA must get transcribed into a piece of RNA. And there's a specific reason for that, I'll tell you in a minute. It then gets translated into the amino acid sequence of the protein. So DNA becoming RNA is called transcription, as you can see in the picture on the screen, and then RNA becoming the protein is called translation. We're going to talk a lot about this this semester, because if there's something wrong on the DNA, if there's an error on the DNA, then you're going to make the wrong piece of RNA, and then you're going to have the wrong amino acid sequence on the protein. And that really is the basis for every single human genetic disorder. So this is incredibly important to understand. When something goes wrong, mainly that you have inherited the wrong sequence on your DNA, or you have a mutation that occurs during your lifetime on your DNA sequence that causes you to transcribe the wrong RNA, which causes you to assemble the wrong amino acid sequence for the protein and the protein doesn't function correctly because it doesn't have the same shape. And we'll talk about why that is. Okay, so just to quickly tell you what nucleic acids include that we're going to talk about in this class, we're going to talk about your genetic code, which as I've mentioned is the recipe for how to assemble your proteins. And that's going to include the DNA and your RNA. We're going to talk about several different types of RNA. Namely, we're going to talk about what's called messenger RNA that we abbreviate mRNA. We're going to talk about tRNA, which stands for transfer RNA. And we're going to talk about rRNA, which stands for ribosomal RNA. So mRNA, this is messenger RNA. T stands for transfer. And R stands for ribosomal. We will not talk about the details of these three types of RNA until later in the semester when we talk in detail about transcription, transcription and translation. Okay, we're also going to talk about two other types of nucleic acid that are incredibly important. We've already talked about these briefly, and that is ATP and ADP. ATP and ADP are both nucleic acids also that do something very different. They are involved in the energy story in the cell. So nucleic acids have a variety of incredibly important functions. This is the link to the video. I am going to post this separately, but in this video, I just wanna quickly tell you, there's this image of a castle and the DNA is locked in that castle and it can't leave. It needs to get the recipe out to the chefs in the cytoplasm of the sea who need to cook the recipe. So. In this video, a typical cell, sorry, for some reason I'm not drawing right now, I'm like all over the place. A typical cell would have a nucleus. And in this nucleus is your DNA. All 46 of your chromosomes, all stretched out like spaghetti. During normal cell function, if this cell isn't actively dividing, that DNA is all stretched out so that every time you need to make a protein, an enzyme can get in there, access that DNA recipe and read it and make a copy. It makes a copy of just that one recipe for one protein. We've used a term already this semester, gene. A gene is a region of DNA that codes for one protein.
So when it's time to make a protein, you don't make a copy of all of your DNA. You make a copy of just that one recipe. Okay, good analogy is you wanna make mac and cheese and it's on page 125 of a big cookbook you own. You wouldn't start on page one and cook every single thing and then finally it's like, whew, here we are three months later, we finally got to the mac and cheese. No, you're gonna just go to page 125 and you're just gonna cook that one page, right? So that's exactly what happens when we need to make a protein. We go to just that one region of the DNA and we make a copy just of that. That copy is the messenger RNA. It's taking the message from your DNA out to the cytoplasm where that protein is going to get assembled. So here's the deal that the protein is going to get assembled out here on some important cell structures called ribosomes. Ribosomes are the site of protein assembly. This is the assembly plant. Okay, they don't magically make proteins, they assemble proteins from the amino acids that you already have in your cell. How do they know which amino acid to put first, second, third, fourth, 105th? They know because that piece of messenger RNA is going to carry the message to the ribosome and tell it in which order to assemble. So here I'm going to show just this one gene is going to make this little green piece of messenger RNA. I'm going to call this mRNA. And it's a copy of just one gene. Okay, that messenger RNA leaves the nucleus. It finds a ribosome, a ribosome assembles around the messenger RNA. And it's going to read that recipe and it's going to start assembling a protein. That protein is a chain of amino acids. And the key is it's folded into a specific three-dimensional shape. And we're going to talk a lot about this today. The shape of that protein is very critical. We've already talked about protein shape when we talked about pH. And remember, proteins function in a very narrow range of pH, temperature, salinity. Any of these factors that change can change the shape of the protein and it no longer functions. If you don't have their correct amino acid sequence, it will also change the shape of the protein and it won't function correctly. And we're going to talk a lot about that. So that protein is a chain of amino acids. That chain of amino acids though, before it folds has a different name. And we're going to talk about that in a minute too. But what I wanna show you is that um, that ribosome is going to start assembling this protein. And as it reads the messenger RNA, it's going to move along. And that protein is going to start emerging. This chain of amino acids is going to start emerging. Okay, and eventually it's going to fold into its final three-dimensional shape and we're going to get this fully formed protein. In the video, that DNA is locked in the nucleus. They have this be a castle. It's locked in the nucleus, it can't leave. And there's a little scribe who's throwing recipes out the window of the castle, okay? so. Those recipes are the messenger RNA. So we're gonna call those the recipes. <laughs> These ribosomes are the cooks, okay? And whatever recipe the cooks receive, they cook it. And those recipes are for proteins. So castle, the DNA is locked in the castle, it can't leave, so that scribe's in there. He's copying recipes from the cookbook. He's throwing them out the window. They go out here into the cytoplasm C and those cooks start making whatever recipes they receive. Those cooks are the ribosomes. They start assembling those proteins and cranking out as many copies of that protein as you need. So please watch that video. It's a very cool picture to have in your head. It's very non-scientific, but sometimes the non-scientific analogies really work. Okay, so DNA codes from messenger RNA. That messenger RNA is for just one gene, not all of your DNA. That recipe goes out to the cooks, the ribosomes, and they cook whatever protein is needed at that time.
So close relationship between nucleic acids and proteins. Okay, here's a chain of amino acids. When you recall that original chart we made about the macromolecules, remember that the monomers for proteins are the amino acids. So proteins follow this model of monomers linking together to form polymers. So the monomers are the amino acids. We have 20 different amino acids that make up our proteins. And all 20 of those are listed at the bottom of this slide. You do not need to memorize the 20 amino acids, okay? What you do need to realize is that each amino acid has a three-letter abbreviation. We will be using that later in the semester. So when you see ALA, okay, ALA is not the name of the amino acid, that's alanine. So you just need to be aware that every amino acid has a three-letter abbreviation that stands for a longer name. So 20 different amino acids that make up our proteins. And again, it's your DNA that's going to determine the order and number of those amino acids in a protein. They have to be exactly right in the right sequence to give you the correct shape for that protein. And we're going to see how that happens. That chain of amino acids is the polymer. And it's not really called a protein yet. It's not called a protein until it folds into until it folds into its specific three-dimensional shape. That just that chain of amino acids is called the polypeptide chain. And you can see that term here. So the polymer is the polypeptide chain. The polypeptide chain is a chain of amino acids. This is an amino acid and all 20 amino acids have the same basic structure. They only differ in structure in one location and that is what we call the R group. You can see this R at the top of this amino acid. So all amino acids have this central carbon called the alpha carbon. So central carbon, the alpha carbon. And then on one side is a carboxyl group. Remember we saw a carboxyl group with the lipids, but this is not a lipid. We know this isn't a lipid because it's not a, a long hydrocarbon chain attached to this carboxyl group. Instead, we have for the first time an amino group. Okay, so you can see why these are called amino acids because they have an amino group. Please, from the very beginning, I want you to realize an amino group and an amino acid are not the same thing. Okay, amino group is just this nitrogen. It can have two or three hydrogens depending on if it's ionized or not. This particular one they're showing only has two. You don't need to worry about those differences. What tells you this is an amino group is that nitrogen right there. It's a nitrogen with either two or three hydrogens attached. The amino group, this is a functional group. It's not an entire molecule. Okay, so amino group is different from amino acid. This entire monomer right here is an amino acid. Okay, and again, we have 20 different amino acids. That means we have 20 different R groups. Otherwise, all 20 amino acids have the exact same basic structure. So central carbon, carboxyl group on one side, amino group on the other side. And then right here, there's always just a hydrogen. And then there's that R group. What do I mean by that? Okay, here are all 20 of your amino acids. You do not need to in any way memorize all 20 structures of the amino acids. But what you do need to recognize is you need to recognize that that's an amino acid. And then if you have a chain of those, it's a polypeptide chain. Those are both part of ultimately the, the intact three-dimensional protein. So what's cool about these functional groups, I'm, I'm sorry, what's cool about these R groups, okay, different from the functional group, what's cool about these R groups is they're all different for all 20 amino acids. And the R groups are what give each amino acid its unique chemical properties. So R groups give each amino acid its unique 
chemical properties. Because all 20 are different. So for example, all those in yellow, those are all hydrophobic. The ones in green are all hydrophilic. And then we have some that are charged. Let me show you those closer. So these are the hydrophobic amino acids. And when those are in a chain, they tend to be repelled by water. Remember, if something's hydrophobic, it means it's nonpolar, which means it's repelled by water. It doesn't mix with water. All of these proteins are in your body. You've got water everywhere. So guess what? If those are in a chain, they're going to kind of fold and tuck inside. So that's going to affect the shape of the protein. Having nonpolar amino acids in the chain is going to cause ultimately part of the shape of that protein. Okay, on the outside of the protein, we would tend to see the hydrophilic ones. Okay, those can interact with water. Those are water loving and those will typically not fold in. Then we have some different charges on these amino acids. So when you get them all in a chain, they start interacting with each other. And it's the interactions among the R groups that are ultimately going to cause that protein to fold into a specific three-dimensional shape. So ultimately, the final three-dimensional shape of the protein is the result of those interactions among the R groups of the amino acids in the polypeptide chain. Hey, I always like to think of you have a bunch of preschoolers and you tell them to line up and hold hands. So they're all in a line and they're holding hands, just like the amino acids in that polypeptide chain. Okay, and they all have a different R group sticking up here. And those R groups all start interacting with each other. It's impossible for them to keep their hands off from each other. You get a bunch of preschoolers in a line, they start poking at each other, prodding each other. Pretty soon they're wrestling with each other. And that's the th same thing that happens with these amino acids in the chain. I have a picture of that somewhere here. <laughs> okay, so imagine this whole chain of amino acids. They're showing it as a ribbon, which I dislike in this picture, but I couldn't find a, a perfect picture. Imagine all these amino acids in a chain. Some of them are going to hydrogen bond with each other. Some are going to ionically bond. The, the hydrophobic ones are going to tuck inside the chain. So ultimately, this is what's going to result in the three-dimensional shape of the protein. That protein is going to fold into that three-dimensional shape based on these interactions among the R groups. If you have the wrong amino acid in the chain, it is going to be a different interaction and that protein is not going to have the same shape. You have to have the exact correct amino acid sequence for a protein. So every human on earth, if they're making a protein correctly, we're all making it with the exact same amino acid sequence. That's pretty crazy. I just wanna show you real quickly, um, this is a chain of amino acids. So this is starting to build a polypeptide chain. And remember we link monomers together to form polymers by dehydration reaction, removal of water. So here we go, here's another example of it, dehydration reaction. Removing water. So you can see an H here and an OH here. We're going to link those amino acids together. How do I know this is an amino acid chain? It has a carboxyl group at one end and it has an amino group at the other end. So no matter how long this chain gets, there's always going to be an amino group at one end and a carboxyl group at the other end when they're all linked together. So if you see this on the test, if you see a chain of amino acids, and I ask you what category of macromolecule is this? Okay, you only have four choices, carbohydrate, 
lipid, nucleic acid, or protein. You know this is a protein because it has a carboxyl group at one end and an amino group at the other end. So we would say that this is a protein. This shows you the three-dimensional shape of two different proteins. Okay, so protein from a flu virus and then an antibody that is produced to combat that virus. Okay, antibodies are huge in our world right now, right? We're all hoping we have antibodies now to coronavirus, specifically the COVID-19 variety of the coronavirus. And if you've either been infected naturally or you've had the vaccine, you hopefully have antibodies against that virus. You're, you're not producing an antibody against the entire virus. In the case of the coronavirus, you are producing an antibody against a spike protein on the outer membrane of that virus. Antibodies are very, very specific. It's a, it's a very tight shape fit. So you have to make new antibodies for each specific type of virus and even different strains of that same virus in some cases. That's why you need a different flu shot every year. So antibodies are just one of the categories of protein we're going to talk about. I'm going to go through the list of the different categories of protein in a few minutes. First, I want you to understand a little bit more about protein structure. Obviously, you know, when we were looking at a chain of glucose, either forming starch or glycogen or cellulose, that was a pretty simple structure. Okay, it was just a chain of glucose. Sometimes it was branched, sometimes it wasn't, but protein structure has a lot more complexity. So protein structure really um, falls in, it's categorized by either primary, secondary, tertiary, or quaternary structure. So there are four levels of protein structure that we're going to talk about. Oops. So four levels of protein structure. Primary, so primary means first. Secondary. Tertiary, if you've never heard this word before, it means third. And then finally, quaternary, which means fourth. Those are the four levels of protein structure. Important to understand this. The primary or first level of protein structure is simply what is the amino acid sequence of that protein? Okay, and ultimately that determines everything. <laughs> so this is the most important part. Okay, so the primary structure of a, of a protein is our first level of protein structure, and it is the amino acid sequence of that protein. Which one comes first? Which one comes second? Which one comes 104th? That is what we call the primary structure of the protein. Again, every one of those amino acids has an R group that interacts with each other to ultimately form the three-dimensional shape of that protein. If even one amino acid in that chain is different or wrong, then that protein will not fold the same and it will not have the same shape. It will not have the same function. Okay, primary structure, amino acid sequence. Secondary structure is a little bit harder to understand. And this is the result of hydrogen bonding between some of the amino acids in the chain. And I told you at the very beginning, we were going to see hydrogen bonding in three different types of molecule this semester, water, proteins, nucleic acids. Here we go. And we're looking at hydrogen bonds now in proteins. In a polypeptide chain, there are certain amino acids that will hydrogen bond with each other and result in one of two different repeating shapes. One is this coiled shape called an alpha helix. So this is the alpha sign right here. So we can call that, if we wrote it out, it would be alpha helix. So it's this coiled shape. Okay, and this is beta. So this little symbol is beta. And we call it a beta pleated sheet. And it is folded in a very specific 
configuration. And again, this is all the result of hydrogen bonding between specific amino acids to produce this pattern. Now, some proteins will have a region of coiling, some will have a region of coiling and folding. Maybe a protein has neither of these, but when it does have this, we call that the secondary structure of the protein. Okay, so this protein is folding into its three-dimensional shape, and then it's gonna have a region that's folded, and then maybe it has a region of coiling to ultimately produce the three-dimensional shape of that protein. And when that happens, that's called the secondary structure of that protein. Okay, and then finally, the. The third level, the tertiary structure of that protein, this is the three-dimensional shape of the protein. And it is the result of interactions among the R groups of the amino acids in the chain. Okay, and it's also called the conformation of the protein. So a lot of terms here are being used for the same thing. Conformation means the three-dimensional shape, okay, which means the tertiary structure of the protein. Sorry, I, I drew through shape there, but those all really mean the same thing. We can use those terms in, in, in I'm sorry, interchangeably. So when we talk about the conformation of a protein, we're talking about its shape. If we say the conformation of a protein has changed, we mean the shape has changed. All proteins, for the most part, have a very specific three-dimensional shape, okay? If that shape is different, if that conformation is different, it doesn't function correctly, okay? I've said it several times already, but I'm gonna write it again. Shape is key in biology. If something doesn't have the same shape, it doesn't have the same function. So shape is the most important thing for proteins. Some proteins also have what's called quaternary structure. So this is not in all proteins. In fact, it's rare. Okay, so not in all proteins. And this occurs for specific proteins that consist of more than one polypeptide chain. Okay, so most proteins are a single polypeptide chain folded into its final configuration. Okay, but some proteins consist of multiple polypeptide chains. And when that happens, we say that protein has quaternary structure. I'm going to give you two classic examples of that. This is collagen, which you know is part of your skin. Okay, it's also part of your tendons and ligaments. Collagen is a very important connective tissue in your body. And it is three polypeptide chains. And they're actually braided together. So rather than just being one polypeptide chain that's folded into a specific configuration, there are three that are braided together. So this is a very strong connective tissue. So we would say that collagen has quaternary structure because it consists of more than one polypeptide chain. This is hemoglobin. It's on your red blood cells and it carries oxygen very important um, protein in your body. And it consists of four polypeptide chains. You can see two of them in purple and two of them kind of turquoise. Okay, so one, two, three, four separate polypeptide chains that make up that protein. So we would say that hemoglobin has quaternary structure. It also has primary structure. It has some secondary structure. It has tertiary structure, just like all proteins, but then it has this fourth level. Classic example that involves hemoglobin. This shows you the critical importance of amino acid sequence in the final shape of that protein. So red blood cells have this carrier protein called hemoglobin that carries oxygen. And 
That amino acid sequence, just like all proteins, has to be exactly correct. You can see in this picture that that sixth amino acid is normally glutamine. But you can see this mutation, this change in that amino acid sequence has the wrong amino acid in that place. It has valine instead. This is a DNA mutation that is inherited. And it's called sickle cell disease. One amino acid is different, is incorrect, okay? And it's due to the wrong sequence on the DNA. And it's inherited. Sorry, it gets a little squirrely at the bottom here. It doesn't want to write correctly. I shouldn't be writing this close to the bottom. Okay. <laughs> One amino acid is incorrect due to wrong DNA sequence that's inherited. And this, can sh this shows you the power of just one amino acid being wrong. One amino acid being wrong means the hemoglobin has the wrong shape and hence the entire red blood cell has the wrong shape. So you can see that sickled, a sickle is, you know, has that half moon shape and that's why it's called sickle cell disease. The red blood cells have the wrong shape. They have very reduced oxygen carrying capacity. And again, showing you one amino acid wrong in that protein folds into the wrong shape. That protein doesn't function correctly. We'll look at many, many examples of that this year in this semester, I mean, and again, this is the basis for almost every single human hereditary disorder. The wrong DNA sequence ultimately results in the wrong messenger RNA sequence, which gives you the wrong amino acid sequence in the protein. Very, very important to understand. Of course, we've talked about that you can have a normal protein that experiences a change in pH or temperature and it causes that protein to be denatured. So I don't want you to forget those terms that we learned back when we talked about pH during the properties of water. That denaturation can be due to change in temperature. So if you put an egg white on a hot pan, you have witnessed denaturation of a protein. You've seen that protein change shape. It's, it goes from clear to opaque white very quickly due to that heat unraveling, denaturing that protein. Okay, we also talked about change in pH causing this. You could also have change in salinity. So increase in salts can, can cause this. If you've ever put salt on um, fish or other meat, it starts to break the proteins down and tenderize it, almost cook it, and, and that's why. When you put lemon juice or lime juice on seafood to make ceviche or something else, you notice a change in the color of that fish or that shellfish. And um, that's a change in pH due to the acidity of that lemon or lime juice. So that's denaturation. It really changes the three-dimensional shape of that protein and it no longer functions correctly. Okay, what do we mean by proteins? I want to just quickly talk about the different categories of protein. Here they are all together. There's a lot going on on this slide, but don't worry. There are separate slides for each of these as well. Sorry, I just keep checking to make sure my microphone is still working correctly because it tends to decide to just quit right in the middle of a lecture sometimes. Okay, the most numerous proteins in your body are enzymes. We're going to talk a lot more about enzymes this semester, but important to realize enzymes are catalysts for um, chemical reactions. They cause chemical reactions to take place with less energy required. And a lot of chemical reactions in your body require enzymes to occur. Without the enzyme, the, the reaction never happens. That's a very important category of protein in your body. Here's an example of digestive enzymes hydrolyzing your food molecules. So with the help of water, um, so this would be an enzyme plus water in this example. 
to hydrolyze. So this is hydrolysis. Remember I said hydrolysis requires enzymes. We talked about the digestive enzymes that um, do hydrolysis in your digestive system. So enzymes are critically important in facilitating chemical reactions in your body. And those are a category of proteins. We have storage proteins that are actually a storage form of amino acids. If you think about an egg white, there are enough proteins in that egg white, enough amino acids to build a whole critter. So whether it's a reptile, a, an amphibian, a bird, a fish, any kind of animal that requires an egg to develop an insect. I mean, everything up until mammals requires eggs, okay? So sea urchins, um, everything, all invertebrates require eggs. And, and there are amino acids in that egg white that builds that organism. Another form of storage protein would be the milk protein for mammals. So the, the casein that's in that milk helps build structures in that developing baby. And that's a, a, a trait unique to mammals. Only mammals have milk. Structural proteins actually form structures in the body. So keratin and collagen would be good examples of structural proteins. You can see that connective tissue that is comprised of collagen. We have contractile proteins that cause movement. So not only in your muscles, but also in the cell, you're going to have these things called motor proteins that we're going to talk about when we look at the cell in more detail that help move materials around in the cell. Also entire cells can be propelled by cilia and flagella, different ways for our cells to move. So if you look at protists, for example, they use these motor proteins to actually move. So contractile proteins are very important. Receptor proteins are on the cell surface and certain molecules bind to these proteins and cause a specific response. So you can see these receptor proteins on a nerve cell here. There are um, signaling molecules that are connecting and attaching to those receptor proteins and causing a specific response. Trans proteins are in your cell membrane. And when we start talking about the cell membrane coming up pretty soon, you're going to see how important these proteins are in facilitating transport across the cell membrane. If a protein recognizes a specific molecule, it will move that molecule in or out of the cell. We also just looked at a transport protein, hemoglobin, that transports oxygen. So important transport proteins on the surfaces of some of your cells. Well, actually on all of your cells. <laughs> okay, then there are certain proteins that are hormones. Um, we talked about lipid-based hormones. Remember estrogen, testosterone, progesterone, cortisol. Those are all hormones that are made of lipids. We also talked about insulin and glucagon that are um, hormones that are made of protein. So insulin and glucagon, remember two opposing hormones that play a role in regulating your blood glucose levels. And these are both protein hormones. Remember hormones are chemical signals. They are produced in one part of the body and travel through the bloodstream to another target tissue to have an action somewhere else. And then defensive proteins. So defensive proteins are the antibodies. Very, very specific shape. They're these Y-shaped proteins and they attach to a specific region of a pathogen or other foreign particle to keep it from being able to get into your cells. So here's the list of proteins you should know this list of proteins, so the different categories or types of proteins and no kind of an explanation for each one. Very brief, just the, the level of detail I just gave you is, is satisfactory. Okay, again, just a reminder that there is a strong connection between nucleic acids and proteins. So this shows the DNA in the nucleus, a piece of mRNA is made. Remember that mRNA represents just one gene on the, pro, on the DNA, which codes for one protein, okay? so one gene is all we copy, and that's the code for one protein. That messenger RNA leaves the nucleus and a ribosome assembles around it. The ribosome is the assembly plant for that protein. We're going to see later in the semester, there are some other key players here, including transfer RNA, which is not shown in this story, in this version of the story. This is the very reduced version of the story. You'll get the details later. Those amino acids are just in your cell. 
They're going to be carried to the ribosome by the transfer RNAs. We're going to assemble a polypeptide chain with a very specific amino acid sequence that was determined by your DNA. So the wrong base on the DNA means the wrong base on the messenger RNA, which means the wrong amino acid sequence in that protein. And you're going to see later in the semester exactly how that occurs. So proteins and nucleic acids are very tightly linked. Let's look at the structure now of nucleic acids. So the monomers of nucleic acids are called the nucleotides. I'm sorry, I'm trying to not touch the screen with my hand while I'm writing because then it really messes things up. Okay, monomers are called nucleotides. Okay, and the polymer, which is a chain of nucleotides, remember polymers, a chain of monomers, they're called polynucleotides. Okay, so this is a nucleotide for a nucleic acid. Okay, so we're talking about nucleic acids now. And we're not going to go into a ton of detail about the structure of nucleic acids yet. You will get that later in the semester. We'll talk about DNA replication. We'll talk about transcription and translation. That's when you'll get more detail about the nucleic acids, but I want you to be able to visually recognize a nucleotide and realize that it is part of the category of macromolecules known as a nucleic acid. Okay, so it starts with that sugar, that pentose sugar. Remember, pentose sugar means it's a five carbon sugar, it forms this pentagon shape. So this pentose sugar is at the center of a nucleotide, which is the monomer for nucleic acids. And that sugar can be either ribose or deoxyribose. Okay, so if you think back to the carbohydrates lecture, I showed you the structure of these two pentose sugars and I told you that these would be a part of DNA and RNA. Okay, they're also a part of ATP and ADP as you'll see in a few minutes. Basic difference between these two sugars is that one has an OH and one is missing the oxygen. So deoxy without oxygen. If it just has an H right there, that's deoxyribose. That is a different sugar. Even just that subtle difference makes it a different sugar. DNA is made of a different sugar than RNA. Okay, so deoxyribose is found in DNA. Ribose is found in RNA. And you're gonna see that ribose is also found in ATP and ADP. So ribose is found in three of the categories of nucleic acids that we're going to talk about. Okay, then there's a type of base here. It's called a nitrogenous base because it does have nitrogen as part of the base. So you do have nitrogen as part of nu your nucleic acids as well as your proteins. And you can see that there are several different types of base that this can be. So remember how on the amino acids, there were 20 different R groups. Well, guess what, for RNA, oops, for RNA, there are four different nitrogenous bases. I'm just going to call them bases. And for DNA, there are four different bases. So similar to how we had 20 different R groups, this is less complex, okay? So this can be one of four different bases if it's RNA, and it can be one of four different bases if, if it's DNA. This shows you the structure of those different bases over here on the right. There is some redundancy. Okay, so for RNA, I'm trying to decide where to write this. <laughs> okay, so for RNA and DNA, you can have cytosine, adenine and guanine. We typically represent those by just the letter. Okay, so this could be, if this was RNA we're talking about, this could be a C, meaning it's cytosine. Okay, it could be an A, meaning it's adenine. It could be a G, meaning guanine. So if it's RNA, there's gonna be a fourth one and that is this one, uracil. Okay, so this could also be a U. 
or uracil. If this is DNA, it would have a different sugar. Okay, it would have deoxyribose rather than ribose. And then the four different bases it could have, it could have A, adenine, it could have C, it could have G, okay, or DNA doesn't have uracil, instead it has a base called bimine. So this would be a T instead of a U if this was DNA. I want to actually in a minute draw those all out for you individually so you can see what I mean by that. So pentose sugar, a nitrogenous base, and then phosphate group. Okay, so finally we're seeing the phosphate group. Remember this was a functional group you had to learn in the intro to organic chemistry lectures. Phosphate group is a part of nucleic acids. It's a part of DNA, RNA, ADP, ATP. In fact, in the ATP, ADP story, that phosphate group is going to play an incredibly important role. It's going to represent energy transfer. So, so, so important. So you're going to be seeing phosphate groups a lot when we start talking about energy. It is part of the nucleic acid structure. Okay, so a single one of these is called a nucleotide. If you get a chain of them, it's a polynucleotide. If it's a single chain, we're looking at RNA. If it's a double chain, we're looking at DNA. So I'll show you that in a minute. Here's a blow up of just that nucleotide. It's called a nucleoside, um, this region over here, but don't pay any attention to that. I don't use that term. Okay, this entire monomer is called a nucleotide. And then just realize that this region over here is where the base is. Okay, I told you I was going to draw this all out for you. I just want you to realize that when we're talking about DNA versus RNA, if this was DNA, we would have four different monomers. And the only place they differ is at the base. So I'm going to draw a very um, reduced version. I'm just going to draw a P with a circle around it to represent that phosphate group. Okay, so if this is DNA, we have four different monomers. They all have deoxyribose as the sugar. So I'm just going to draw an H there. Okay, and they all have a phosphate group, all four of them. So let's just go ahead and draw that part. Oops. Sorry, I'm having to use room where I can find it. Okay, so those are the four. Now here's where they all four differ is what's attached right here, this base. If this is DNA, this can be A, C, G, or T. So adenine, cytosine, guanine, thymine. So A is adenine. C is cytosine. Oh my, it just gets crazy down here. Okay, G is guanine and T is thymine. And we usually just represent it with the letter. Okay, RNA. Also has four different monomers and they are made from a different sugar. Okay, so even if they have the same base, it's not the same monomer. It's totally different because it's made from a different sugar. Okay, so I'm going to draw them. 
I'm really sorry that every time I touch the screen, something crazy happens. Okay, different sugar. This is ribose, not deoxyribose. So it has an OH there. Sorry, I'm drawing these very messy. Okay, still has a phosphate group. The only place these four monomers differ is at the base. And that base is going to be A, C, G, and there is no thymine in RNA, there is uracil. So U equals uracil. Okay, this is very, very important. Even though we have A, C, G, a, C, G, those are not the same monomer, okay? RNA is made from ribose sugar and DNA is made from deoxyribose sugar. So DNA is made from different monomers than RNA. That's very important to realize. That's why I take the time to draw this all out, okay? So when, when RNA makes a polymer, it can be any possible order of these. You could have 10 A's in a row and then a C, or you know, it can be any combination of A, C, G, and U. RNA is a single strand or chain of monomers. Okay, whereas DNA is a double strand. And I'm going to show you what I mean by that. This slide is just showing you again, the difference in structure from deoxyribose and ribose. Two different sugars. So even if they have the same phosphate group and the same base attached, they're not the same. Okay, I love this cute little picture of DNA versus RNA. Okay, so DNA is a double strand. RNA is a single strand. Also use different sugar, deoxyribose versus ribose. And you can see the four different bases. So you can see three of them are the same, but DNA has thymine, okay? And RNA has uracil. Different sugar, ribose sugar, deoxyribose sugar. Double-stranded, single-stranded. Important to know the differences in structure between DNA and RNA. This shows you the details of the DNA. Okay, these are called anti-parallel strands. They run in opposite direction. So we say that DNA is, is made of two anti-parallel strands, two anti-parallel chains of nucleotides. So you can see that the sugars are upside down, um, opposite of each other. This five prime to three prime, don't worry about that right now. What you do need to realize though, here we go. This is our third time we're seeing this, this semester. Hydrogen bonds connect the two chains. This is very significant when we start making proteins or copying our DNA. Remember, hydrogen bonds are very easy to break. You have to go in and break these bonds in order to be able to have an enzyme read this DNA to make messenger RNA or read this DNA to make a copy of the DNA. So the two anti-parallel strands are connected by hydrogen bonds. This is kind of the more cartoony version. And you can see all they're doing is the side ladder. This is really the sugar and the phosphate. So the pinto sugar and the phosphate group. And then this is just the bases that are sticking out in the middle and they're connected by hydrogen bonds. You can see that A and T always pair with each other and G and C always pair with each other. So anywhere there's an A on one side, okay, there's gonna be a T on the other, G, C, C, G, A, T. That's called complementary base pairing. Complementary with an E, they're not saying, hey, I really like your shirt. The complementary and that they go together. So complementary base pairs. A and T always go together, 
C and G always go together. So if there's an A on one side, that means there's going to be a T on the other. T, A, C, G, G, C. So if you know the sequence of, on one side of the DNA, you can predict the sequence on the other side. I'm going to go back to a blank area here and let's just do that really fast. So if this was my one side of my DNA, I'm going to write a base sequence. I'll write this a little more clearly. That's a G. Okay, and I'm going to do another color for this. Okay, so my other side, we can predict what that would be based on complementary base pairing. If I have an A on one side, I'll have a T here. C goes with G. C goes with G. G goes with C. T goes with A. A goes with T. And those are hydrogen bonded together. And we represent that, remember, with three dots. A and T actually have two hydrogen bonds between them and C and G have three, but I'm just gonna draw one for purposes of this simplified picture. So hydrogen bonds connect the two anti-parallel strands. Anti-parallel can be written hyphenated or unhyphenated. I've seen it both ways. Okay, so DNA is a double strand of nucleotides. RNA is a single strand. There are three types of RNA we're going to talk about this semester. And I listed those at the beginning. So this is mRNA for short. That is the copy of your DNA that carries the recipe out to the ribosome to make the protein. Ribosomal RNA is going to be part of the ribosome structure. And tRNA, transfer RNA, carries the amino acids to the ribosome. And you're going to see how that happens. Just a quick reminder that ADP and ATP, which are the energy currency of the cell, we're going to talk about this story when we talk about cell respiration and photosynthesis. And you can see it's a, nu it's a nucleotide. Okay, so they both consist of ribose sugar. This actually is adenine. So they both have A for their base. Okay, and here we go. Adenosine triphosphate. Okay, that means three phosphate groups, triphosphate, one, two, three. That's ATP. ADP, adenosine diphosphate. So this is ADP. Two phosphate groups. This is going to be an important part of the energy story. So I just want you to see the structure now. Realize that these are nucleic acids. They're not involved in the DNA RNA story. They are involved in the energy story. They'll be involved in cell respiration and in photosynthesis. So adenosine triphosphate, three phosphate groups, but otherwise it looks just like an RNA nucleotide that has adenine as the base. So ribose sugar, adenine, three phosphate groups. Ribose sugar, adenine, two phosphate groups. Okay, that's it for proteins and nucleic acids.